Never in my life did I ever imagine that I would see a drug that could absolutely devastate the way this drug is done. Like that would be a lethal dose. The overdose epidemic has no end in sight. It's driven by illicit fentanyl, and the epicenter of Missouri's crisis is right here in St. Louis. And you see it so often, it becomes a part of your reality. In this special report, we put a spotlight on those working the front line. People are starting to realize, like, we can't keep it quiet anymore. And show the consequences we are left with. My mom didn't want to leave me. She just made a bad mistake. For News 4 in St. Louis, I'm Matt Woods. And this is One Life Too Many, the toll of the overdose crisis. Addiction takes the things that we love most about the people we love and pushes them so far down that you forget that they're there. Addiction is personal for Hannah Wills. Her mom went through it for years. About what time did your mom's struggles with addiction start? I was pretty young. Um, I think she really started to struggle when I was like five or six. And I'm 23 now, so basically it was almost my entire life that she struggled. I know that my mom would want me sitting here and like talking about like what went on because you know, I want to help other people and like let them know like they're not alone. She also sees the effects of addiction as an ER nurse. Becoming an ER nurse has helped me see like what people in our community are like suffering from. I think that I'm able to help my patients um, more than some of the other nurses because, uh, you know, compassion fatigue is a thing, right? And so we look at, we have that stigma with addiction that it's just like, okay, you're, you just want drugs right now. I think stigma is killing people more than people realize. What was the overdose crisis like when you started out as a paramedic? There wasn't one. There, I, I can remember, and I was kind of laughing the other night, that I can only remember a handful of times that I actually gave naloxone. Naloxone is an opioid overdose reversing drug, more commonly known as Narcan. It was kind of one of those things where the first time you used Narcan and you were able to bring somebody back, it was so amazing. And it was, it was kind of a miracle to watch happen back in the day because it didn't happen very much. It was, you know, so rare it was a significant event. Like, hey, I just gave Narcan. And then after the crisis hits, it's like, I'm tired of giving Narcan. You know, we give it so much. Chris Thompson and Lisa Cassidy are career paramedics. Thompson for St. Louis City and Cassidy for St. Charles County. Their experience goes back decades. I took an EMS course and I loved it. And I guess that was pretty much it. I just, it was kind of an adrenaline rush for me at first and I just loved what they did. And then I went straight into paramedic school and this was my first job. I think it was instilled in me from an uh, early age. Like every kid my age, I got hooked on the show Emergency. I saw that and I thought, that's pretty cool. I wanna do that. I just liked being out in the field, being on the road. It's just really nice to just get out there and help people. The real start of this, maybe 2015, late 2014. Somewhere in the 2015 to 2017 range. We started all of a sudden seeing an increase in the number of opioid related calls we were doing. They really spiked and we started seeing them all the time, every day. <laughs> And then quickly in the next few years after that, it became fentanyl. And now fentanyl is what we're seeing all the time. And it's more deadly, it's more prevalent, it's cheap. In 2022, News 4 showed illicit fentanyl's toll on St. Louis with the 50 minute documentary, Contaminated. Gabrielle Cruz's brother John took fentanyl after becoming addicted to other drugs. Around his freshman or sophomore year, he got on Xanax. Um, it was prescribed at first, but then it became like a habitual thing. That, so his body became dependent on it, and then he became addicted to it. Um, and then that turned to opioids, and particularly heroin, which quickly turned to fentanyl. It's in every community. It's in every neighborhood. I've never seen anything like that. And there's no end in sight for it. 
constantly responding to overdoses takes a toll on first responders. Oh, compassion fatigue is a real thing. It really is. My first uh, encounter with an OD a community member had brought in this patient in the back of a pickup truck um, and just found them on the ground. And uh, we had to pull them from this truck and put them on a stretcher and bring them into the ER. And we ended up getting them back, but sometimes we don't get patients back. And so um, that's really hard to see, um, especially these young people that are dying, people our age. There was a learning curve for first responders after the spike in overdoses. Even, even folks in this profession didn't fully understand it for a long time that the science behind addiction and the fact that relapse is a normal part of the recovery process. People just started seeing it so much and they, a lot of it was lack of education. A lot of it is people not understanding what addiction is. I'd mistaken addiction my entire life and it, I think it was just because I was a child I and mean, like not having that parent role sometimes was just like, well, what am I not doing enough of? Something that shook me was uh, a buddy of mine gave me a bumper sticker, said, I Narcan, your honor student. I thought it was hysterical. Until a very, very good friend of mine looked at me and reminded me, that's my sister. That's not funny. And I thought to myself, I know this kid. She is a bright, young, beautiful kid, 16 years old. And this drug has taken her down that path. I kind of keep that in the back of my head when I deal with this now. It's a reality that too often ends in tragedy. We followed um, a young girl for quite a while, actually, who was young. She was 20 and she was pregnant uh, when we met her. And she had been in and out of treatment, got into treatment, uh, was actually doing very well, and then passed away uh, when her daughter, right before her daughter turned a year old. So that was very hard. And, and the mom actually is the one that told us. I have to tell someone, the thing you love is gone and there's not a thing I can do about it. My mom, like, never knew a stranger. She talked to everyone. She was a fun mom. She always tried to, like, when I had friends over, you know, when you have friends over and they're like, oh, what, what can we do? Instead of, like, sitting inside watching TV, we would always do something fun. Rochelle Jones was Hannah Will's mom. She was an artsy person. She and Hannah made this blanket together. This one's an old one that we made. This is her handwriting on Hannah's tattoo. In her life, she battled addiction as well as depression. I always just understood that my mom was like sick, like something was um, wrong. And, you know, um, she also su suffered from mental health issues, which I think a lot of people with substance abuse have, you know, hand in hand. When I was younger, I'd call it gone. Like she'd be gone for a couple days because she would just be sleeping a long time. Rochelle was very close with her father, who died when she was in her 30s. That affected her depression, and along with that, her substance use. It's just like held on to those really good days of like when she was awake and picking me up from school or like cooking food when we got home or the house was clean. It was just like those good days made up for all of the bad. Those days are the ones Hannah has to look back on. Addiction took her mom's life when she overdosed on July 5th, 2021. I think what I have to remember is my mom didn't want to leave me. She just made a bad mistake and that's okay. Gabrielle Cruz shares a similar grief. Her brother John was a smart kid with so much life yet to live. He was just a really funny, outgoing kid. He was Mr. No Fear. He liked, you know, fast cars. He liked, you know, he liked bungee jumping. John's favorite holiday was Christmas. It was always fun to watch him, you know, yeah, like shout with excitement when he would open presents and like, you know, throw wrapping paper at my sister. John's parents divorced when he was young something his sister says had a big impact on his life. He was only six years old. I was 13, my sister was 11. So we had a better understanding that something was wrong in the home, that it's not really working between my parents. But at six years old, you don't really understand that or see that. And I know for a fact that that continued to bother him in grade school and high school. I watched my brother slowly turn from, you know, this awesome, bright, witty person into the worst version of himself in the course of five years. John got home from treatment just before he died. And then five days later, he relapsed and he had a scheduled appointment for a mental health counselor at the time because he was open to doing that to talk about the underlying issues for the substance use, but he didn't make it to that appointment. So my mom had to call and tell them why he was gonna be a no-show. 
lot of people still think, not my house, you know, not my kid. And, it, and if that's what you think, then it probably is somewhere in your house and it probably is your kid. Back in 2016, St. Charles County changed its approach to the overdose crisis. Hey, you know, like we, we need to do something. We've got to do something here because the attitudes are poor. We're not helping people. On this April day, they were at Wentzville South Middle School utilizing an often overlooked approach, prevention. We just hope that the kids listen and more importantly, we hope they hear us that they hear how dangerous these drugs are that are out there currently um, in their schools, in their parties, and that they are aware. So that even though I know kids are curious and there's a lot of peer pressure, we wanna make sure they know how deadly these drugs are. Every school district in this county has had incidences or their students have had incidents or after graduation, those students have fallen into drug addiction. And we could stand here and talk to you and tell you about how, how crappy it is to run these calls and how heart-wrenching it is for the families. But we decided we wanted to show you rather than just tell you. And that's why we're gonna show you this next video. It starts with a real 911 call. This is legit 911 audio. 911, We show that all the way down to the middle school kids, sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. And you can hear a pin drop in the room. I can just tell them what I see, and that's why we like to tell them the down and dirty of what we see, because that makes it real for them. That scenario has played out literally hundreds of times right here in our community. Just hearing that, you know, that mother and yeah, I mean, and that's what we see for real on the scenes, you know, people begging us to save their loved ones. And a lot of times we get there and it's too late. Cassidy went through a tough year as a paramedic in 2020. I had a call that I ended up being treated for PTSD. In 23 years at the time, I had never had this happen to me before. And I just couldn't understand why this, I mean, it was a horrible call, don't get me wrong, a horrible call. But I had run horrible calls before. She ended up working through her PTSD. But how did that affect her career as a paramedic? It broke me, but it didn't stop me. I would say it broke me, but um, I've healed. It's taken a lot of time. I like being a paramedic still, and I want to be a paramedic still, so you can't do that if you're not healthy in your mind. The St. Louis Fire Department is seeing high turnover rates after the COVID-19 pandemic and the overdose epidemic. Chris Thompson has been there for well over two decades. Why have you stayed this long with the St. Louis Fire Department? Why have I, I'm crazy. Um, I love what I do. I love being a paramedic. When I took this job, I got it because I knew I wanted to help people and the people in this city need the help. I felt like there was a calling after my brother's best friend died, 11 months after my brother died of a fentanyl overdose, Jake, his best friend, died of the same fate. Um, and so I felt, after that, I felt sad, of course, but I felt more anger initially, and then anger propelled me to switch my field. Gabrielle became a licensed professional counselor after the deaths of her brother and his best friend. She now works in substance use treatment. I think it's been helpful to use my brother's story. I think it's been powerful for some clients. And I f can feel him talking to me when, and he tells me, John tells me when he wants me to share something of his story to a client. Being in the substance use treatment field has been one of the best ways I've learned to cope with my grief. Coping with grief. It's something thousands of Missouri families now go through every year after an overdose death. At one point I was like, what am I doing this for? Like, what am I doing nursing for? Why am I in school? Like, the grief just hit me so hard. She almost dropped out of nursing school, but she found her motivation. Your mom would want you to do this. You need to do this for yourself. Um, yeah, that's one of like my biggest things I'm proud of because people don't really talk about grief openly. Hannah uses her personal story to help hospital patients. It gives me a sense of purpose and it helps me, I think, create a connection between my own personal life and my patients. I make sure that like 
everyone knows like they're loved and they're not alone and there's like resources for you if you want them and whenever you need them. If you do have a loved one that's addicted to this, don't throw them away. You're gonna have to fight for them because they won't have the ability to fight for themselves. I think that's the saddest thing I see is young people in the prime of their life who say, my family just gave up on me. I think my mom would want me to talk about her as a human and how she was a good person because she was, and she just suffered from addiction. I can say it 20 more times because it's just something that like is rooted deeply inside of me is, you know, you just see the bad and you talk about the bad, but there's so much good underneath that bad.